yesterday, about 20 or so people were here for a really good workshop. From Fair to Faith was the title. It started on time, and it was due 10 o'clock, and it was due to end on time, because it was read, led by Reverend John. It was due to end at 2 o'clock. It did not end at 2 o'clock. The topic was so interesting that it went on another 15, 20 minutes. And I thought that was the end of it. Except that this morning, Reverend John is going to continue his exploration of this very, very fascinating journey from fear to faith. The title of his talk, he whispered to me earlier, was Overcoming Fear. We look forward to hearing what Reverend John the Beloved has to tell us this morning, assignments included. <laughs> Thank you, Reverend Mac Michael. We actually started at 12 minutes and 30 seconds past 10 <laughs> yesterday. Good morning, family. Good morning, all who tune in to this amazing vibration from the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living in beautiful Jamaica and who listen to us on the World Wide Web. It's just so wonderful to see you. A special welcome, too, to our first-time guests and a very old and beautiful friend of mine, Stephanie Kerens, flew in from Tortolo the day before yesterday to separate her mother's, to celebrate, not to separate, to, to celebrate her mother's 85th birthday, Mrs. Jean Smith, and she's here with us. Happy birthday, Jean Jean. This is homecoming week, I think, because then I just saw Winsome Miller Rowe, another person who is a part of my journey in truth, come in this morning. Welcome, Dr. Winsome. Lovely to have you with us. Anybody who hasn't been for a while? Yes, friends, the cords from country, back in Kingston with us this morning too. Welcome everyone to our hearts and, and to this wonderful morning. So yesterday, Reverend Michael was telling you our workshop on moving from fear to faith surfaced a long forgotten, frightening experience that happened when I was about age 11 in my first term at high school. You see, a well-meaning physical education teacher thought he would teach me to swim by tossing me into the deep end of the school's pool. I know now that he wouldn't have allowed me to drown, but I might as well have, because I felt that I was drowning anyhow in the derisive laughter of my classmates and the shame that I felt at, you know, just losing it in the deep end. It was my older brother, Dennis, who helped me overcome the fear of deep water, because I swore the only way it would, I would drown is if it came through the shower. <laughs> <laughs> but one day, at a popular public bath known as the Bournemouth Baths off the Windward Road, Dennis, my brother, dropped a willy penny, which is a large copper coin from our, our British era, into the water at the shallow end, where I was splashing around, being careful not to go near the drop-off into the deep end. He dropped the willy penny and then told me if I reached for it and retrieved it on the first attempt, I could keep it. Wow. Well, that's easy, I thought, as I looked at the penny lying on the bottom and already tasting the lollipop it would buy. Yes, in those days, lollipops cost a penny, half a penny. I thought as I looked at the penny lying on the bottom that this was an easy task. My eyes told me exactly where the coin was, but when I reached for it, I realized it wasn't where I thought it was at all. After a couple of unsuccessful attempts, it dawned on me that I could reach it if I went underwater. <laughs> the very thought filled me with fear. Dennis said, come on, Jay, I'm here and I won't let anything happen to you. And then he quoted from what I later learned was Shakespeare's Macbeth, saying rather pompous, pompously, now screw your courage to the sticking place and you cannot fail. <laughs> it was always a drama queen. 
So I did. I screwed my courage to the sticking place, and I dived in, overcoming my absolute fear of having my head under water for any length of time. Yesterday, 60 years later, I forgave sportsmaster Mr. Robinson. <laughs> Wherever he is, I hope his heart rests easy. I could swear I heard him say, good Scott, well done. <laughs> Today, thanks to this transformative teaching we call the science of mind, I know that God is my sticking place to which I can screw my courage. And like my big brother, God is always there for me, or rather, here for me. And with this assurance, I can overcome all my fears. And so my encouragement today, as Reverend Michael Sherrod, is titled, Overcoming Fear. That experience, you know, friends, of the coin not being where it appeared to be was a powerful lesson for me on how easy it is for our perception to be completely wrong. You ever think you see something and it's not so it go? When we watch the news, for example, we can become very troubled and upset by what we see. Our beautiful Jamaica, and indeed the entire world, seems so much more chaotic, troubled, and even violent than it used to be when we were growing up. As we watch, we ask ourselves, what is the world coming to? And a cold fear may grip some hearts. And the sad thing is, once our vision is distorted by fear, we can see little else. And there was a, a, a comedian who said, what you see is what you get. It is easy to look at the world events and say, this is a harsh and hostile planet. <clears throat> Just look at all the violence and hatred and suffering caused by man's inhumanity to man. But just as the water made it clear how imprecise and distorted our perspective might be, so things are not always what they may seem at first glance. The truth is, we can change our experience by looking beyond the so-called facts that we see with our physical eyes. To do this, we have to begin to modify our perspective, change our inner dialogue, and ask ourselves some different questions. And one of the most powerful questions we can answer for ourselves, and it is one I want to ask you to ask yourself this morning, is do I live in a safe or a hostile universe? Is the universe that I inhabit a safe one or a hostile one? And there's plenty of evidence out there for both. It's almost as though there are two worlds existing side by side. One world is shrouded in fear and chaos. Its unfortunate citizens suffer from everything from hunger and homelessness to road rage. Here in this dark world, murder and mayhem reign supreme. If you can accept this version of the world, you are trapped in a living hell and you will drown in your own fear. The other world is a world filled with peace and endless possibilities, possibilities for God's good. In it, we have the opportunity to see our beliefs and our dreams of good in three-dimensional reality. If you choose to believe in this glorious world, peopled by divine sons and daughters of an awesome God, limitless opportunities open up for you, and your life becomes a joyous, magical journey from good to greater good, and from joy to deeper joy. Friends, you really can choose the world you wish to live in. The story is told of an, a traveler in ancient times who was looking for a new life in a new location. He came to the gates of a city and said to an old man sitting there, good day, sir. I'm looking for a new place in which to settle. How do you find the people in this city? The sage greeted him cordially and said, 
How did you find the folks in your former city of residence? Oh my God, he said. The traveler replied, terrible. That's why I've decided to move away. They're hostile, thieving, selfish, murderous lot of charlatans who cannot be trusted. The sage said, I'm sad to say, good traveler, that the people in this city are exactly as you describe your former neighbors. Not long after the traveler had moved on in search of a better city, another wanderer stopped and addressed the sage. Good day, good sage. I'm looking for a new place in which to settle. How do you find the people in this city? Again, the sage greeted the stranger cordially and asked, how did you find the folks in your former city of residence? Oh, they were wonderful, the traveler responded. A more loving, generous, compassionate, creative people you could not hope to find. I'm only leaving because I want to see more of the world. Ah, said the, the stranger, the sage, then welcome to our city. You will find that the people here are exactly as you described your former neighbors. For you see, friends, wherever you go, what do you take with you? Yourself. Yourself. You take your consciousness. And you will find wherever you go that you have attracted to you what you already have in your consciousness. If you have a consciousness of fear, you will attract more of the same. So what if we chose from this day forward to focus on the perfection of the world instead of what we perceive as the world's problems? What would happen if we decided to see only good from our perspective? In an article in a Science of Mind magazine all the way back in November 2005, which I kept in my discovery scrapbook, author Susan Gregg, who lives in Hawaii, says that they, or lived, I don't know if she's still there, says that the Hawaiian people have a word for that perfection. The word is pono, P-O-N-O. -O. From the viewpoint of pono, everything is always perfect until we think otherwise. And from that thought arises our reaction, our choices, and our experiences. All events are pono, meaning perfect. In explaining the concept of pono, Greg gives the example of a traffic accident caused by a drunk driver. She writes, and I quote, the accident resulted in a woman's death. There was a young boy standing nearby watching the whole event, and from our limited fair-based perspective, the accident would seem to be a tragedy. But, she writes, there is another perspective that is more expansive and love-based. The young boy watched the woman die. He was on his way to becoming a drug addict, but the experience so strongly affected him that he chose a different course. As an adult, he developed a new auto design that saved countless lives. The drug driver went into recovery and helped hundreds of people to stay sober. The woman's family learned about the power of forgiveness. Each of the spirits involved in the incident had an opening to change in a most profound manner." Unquote from Greg. When I read Susan Gregg's article, I wondered how many thousands of people watching the report of that accident on the news had jumped to judgment of that drunk driver. Many undoubtedly felt sorry for the bereaved family of the woman who was killed. And still others may have sighed a prayer of thanks that it wasn't their loved one. And still others may have been indulging in the thought our roads just aren't safe anymore. In Jamaica, hardly a week passes without a report of a tragedy such as this. When we hear of such events, we, may, we have many choices. We can choose to take the high road on which we open our hearts and reaffirm the perfection of each person's path through eternity, through life and what we call death, and we can send out our love to everybody involved. When we hear of tragedy, 
We can rush to judgment and project our fear to the world, or we can choose love instead. We can either use the event as an excuse to intensify our fear or to deepen our belief in Pono, the perfection of Almighty God. Instead of immediately labeling the event good or bad, we can use the occurrence to learn more about ourselves and what we say we believe. We can pause and observe our response to the event. And as Greg puts it, I quote, when we view life as an opportunity to deepen our awareness, we get a very different answer to the questions. What am I going to create or invite into my life and into the world now? What happened, happened. How am I going to use it? I know that even as I am speaking, some of you may be saying to yourself, but isn't that burying your head in the sand like an ostrich? After all, the reality is that conditions such as murder, hunger, and war do exist right on our world, on our doorstep in a shrinking world. Am I to simply ignore them, Reverend John? We can't pretend they don't exist. Come on, get real. I've actually been told that. Well, friends, I've got to tell you, first of all, ostriches don't bury their heads <laughs> in the sand. Second, the paradox is this. As long as we continue to label, to judge, and to view what we call reality through fearful eyes, murder, hunger, and war will continue to be our experience. As far as the universe is concerned, your choice to focus on a fear-filled world is a valid choice. The universe won't contradict you and say, no, God created good, so that is the truth. The universe will simply continue to say yes to your fear-based belief and your fear-based choice. And the things you fear will continue to manifest. For as Job said, the thing I most have feared is come upon me. If on the other hand, you make a choice to use every event as an opportunity to deepen your connection to the spirit of God within you, if you decide to change the way you look at the world, you will, in the words of Moses in Exodus 14, 13, and I quote, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you today. Which brings me to your assignment. Regulars at the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living know I always give an assignment. Your mission, should you decide to undertake it, is when watching or reading the news this week, or if like me you don't do much of that, then whenever you hear any news this week, instead of judging what is presented or feeling anxious about what is happening in the world, ask yourself this question. How can I see this through eyes of love. How can I see this event through eyes of love? And what is the most loving thing I can do? And then simply send love to the people, places, and events involved. Simple assignment, but something we need to be aware of and to commit to doing on a regular basis. When you hear of anything that is unlike the world that you want to live in, just pause for a moment, put your hand on your heart, and just beam the love from your heart center to those people and those places and those events involved. You know, there's a set of people who on Facebook just have all kinds of things to say. You know, they, they delight in spreading what they think is warnings to keep you safe. So if you do the Facebook thing, or the Instagram thing, or the, the social media thing, send the good news that perfection is the truth of God's universe, and that you are choosing to live from the standpoint of divine love today and every day. Yes, can I have an amen? <laughs> Ernest Holmes, the founder of our great teaching, writes in the Science of Mind textbook, and I quote, it's not always easy to turn from fear, from poverty and pain, and from the hurt of human existence 
to that which is perfect. But whoever can do this and will train himself to do it will be like the man healed of blindness. He had little comprehension of how it had been done and could only say, whereas I was blind, now I see, unquote. Just as we can turn from one television channel to another, we can tune into any number of stations within ourselves. So are you clicking on the fair-based judgmental station? Have you been listening to the endless barrage of negative criticisms and declarations of doom? For when you are tuned into that station, you are supporting terrorism, my friends, by terrorizing yourself. <laughs> Don't terrorize yourself and add to the spread of hatred and fear. Thank God we can choose to tune into our spiritual station where we access the inner peace which passes all human understanding. As this wavelength puts us in touch with the innate wisdom with which the Almighty gifted us, we experience a profound feeling of connection with everyone and everything. I've named my inner station CNN, which stands for see no negatives. <laughs> and I find that when I tune in into CNN, I truly respond to the outer world in an entirely different matter, a manner. Interestingly, once I am on see no negatives, CNN, and perceiving the world from that perspective, my need to change outer circumstances diminishes while my ability to influence the world increases dramatically. I have chosen to release judgment and criticism purely because it feels better to live with an open, loving heart than to sit in judgment of others' actions, and this includes judging myself. Susan Gregg writes, and I quote, there is a way to create a world that is safe, loving, and nurturing. That world begins with each of us, and we create it thought by thought, unquote. What kind of world do you desire to live in? If your answer is, I want a peaceful world that is free of fear, then decide right now to stop viewing your world through the eyes of fear. Stop telling yourself and everyone in your circle of friends, colleagues, and acquaintances the scary stories. It really is very simple. Choose love or choose fear. Every time you catch yourself judging an event or a person, ask yourself, how can I see through the eyes of love in this moment? A friend who is a teacher recently asked me, why doesn't God just stop the war since God is so good? I wanted to say because there is no war in God. But I knew this would just provoke an argument, so I counted instead with a question of my own. She teaches mathematics. Why doesn't the principle of mathematics prevent your students from getting the wrong answers? <laughs> to which she wisely replied, the principle of mathematics doesn't know wrong answers. I said, well, you just answer yourself. The principle that we call God doesn't know anything but good. If God knew war or mathematics knew wrong answers, we would live in a, in a, a total chaos and water would flow uphill and the earth would spin off its axis and out into the, um, off on a wild goose chase into nowhere. So when Jesus declares God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth, he is saying if we really want peace, we must embody the spirit of peace and affirm the truth about it. For in God, we are told in James 1, chapter 7, verse 17, there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. There is no guessing and spelling with God, friends. The principle of pono, the principle of perfection, is unchanging and constant and eternal. Greg says that a Hawaiian kapuna, who is a wise elder, told her a story about an old man who was a gifted healer. For generations, he and his family had used a particular warm pond for his work of healing. But one day, a wealthy family purchased the property and erected a tall fence to keep everyone out. The local people were in, enraged and asked the elder what he was going to do. The old man said he was going to aloha them. The Hawaiian term aloha 
has come to be synonymous with hello. But aloha is actually a way of life in which you live, act, feel, and think love. A significant aspect of aloha is the recognition that there is no right or wrong. There is just what is, and what is, is pono. Perfect. So the old man would stand at the edge of the property and aloha the land and its owners. Greg doesn't say whether the local people were ever given access to their healing pool, but I know that their practice of aloha must have changed their lives. For when we make the choice for love, the fences around our own hearts come down, freeing us to live in peace with everyone we encounter on life's path. Let us affirm, but before that, you know, we don't use aloha in Jamaica. What, what would we say? One love. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we began using the term one love in the same spirit of open-hearted acceptance of differences and in honor of the diversity which has created the rich tapestry of Jamaican life? One love. Could we each of us give new meaning to that phrase? Can we just say it together? One love. Let us affirm together, today I make one love the way of my heart and the heart of my way. Today I make one love the way of my heart and the heart of my way. Today I choose to see peace, to feel peace, to be peace. Today I choose to see peace, to feel peace, to be peace. Today I relinquish fear and walk with God. Today I relinquish fear and walk with God. Today I stand still and see the salvation of the law. Today I stand still and see the salvation of the law. To your neighbor say, together we're making a difference. One love, my brother or sister. Today we are making a difference. One love, my brother or sister. Today we're making a difference. One love. A said deep neighbor, not the whole church. Today, we're making a difference. We're choosing to relinquish fear and to lay hold of love. We're choosing to walk with God. We're making a difference. One love, my brothers and sisters. Amen.